Coming up, South Dakota State Senator Sean Bordeaux shares the state's legislative session highlights so far. Plus, we take a look at a documentary exploring Native American mascots and representation in media, and meet a man devoted to revitalizing his native language. We have those interviews, plus headlines ahead on the ICT Newscast. This program is made possible by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, a private corporation funded by the American people. Support for the ICT Newscast with Aliyah Chavez comes from the Arizona PBS Studios in Phoenix at the Walter Cronkite School of Journalism and Mass Communications at Arizona State University. Amidawahopa, thank you for joining us. I am Aliyah Chavez. A decision by a federal court has given a foreign-owned mining company the green light to destroy the sacred site Oak Flat in Arizona. Late last week, the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals ruled that the federal government can transfer the land to the company Resolution Copper, all to dig for copper ore in a nearly two-mile-wide and 1,100-foot-deep crater. The decision came with six judges in favor and five against. Attorneys for the Apache stronghold, the group wanting to save Oak Flat, tell ICT the case is now on a fast track to the U.S. Supreme Court. This is a narrowly divided decision, 6-5 from, from the, the Ninth Circuit. It's very rare that these kind of cases uh, go to this stage in the first place, get 11 judge review, and then even rarer that they split along these 6-5 six, five, six, five lines with 250 pages of opinions. So I think this only underscores how important this case is and how, how likely of a candidate it is for, for further review. The mine has historically been opposed by 21 of Arizona's 22 tribal nations and by the National Congress of American Indians. We are tracking a bill in South Dakota where last week it passed the state's legislature to address what one lawmaker calls an Indian child welfare crisis. 74% of children in the state's foster care system are Native, yet Natives are only 13% of the population. The bill would convene tribes, lawmakers, social service officials, and others in an advisory panel to craft solutions. Representative Tamara St. John says the time to act is now. We need those advocates, we need those nonprofits, and our state representatives too. We need everybody at the table. It's sort of an all hands on deck because this is a crisis. ICT asked Governor Christy Nome's office if she planned to sign the bill and we did not immediately hear back. We head now to the Great Lakes, where an ancient birch bark scroll has been welcomed home with emotional ceremony. The scrolls were headed to auction, but quick action saved them from ending up in private hands. A GoFundMe campaign and help from the Bay Mills Indian community raised enough money to buy back the scrolls that recorded Ojibwe history and religion. Last month, they were returned to Ojibwe territory, sparking emotional reactions, according to Bay Mills President Whitney Gravel. It was a really emotional return of the scrolls, something that was made so long ago stood the test of time, and we are going to be able to learn from those scrolls and interpret them and then share their teachings. In Hawaii, six midwives are suing the state for medical colonialism. The lawsuit claims a new law criminalizes indigenous birth customs and hollows out medical care for pregnant women and families across the state. Many Native Hawaiian medicine experts practice traditionally without official licenses. However, the state passed a law in July of 2023 requiring all birth workers to obtain a specific license. Under the new law, birth workers risk a $2,000 fine and up to one year in prison if they are caught offering care or even advice to pregnant women and families. 
In Minnesota, a new indigenous baby food company is aiming to give babies good nutrition. The first jars of indigenous baby food were released last year and provide families with healthy food alternatives. Created by the Indigenous Peoples Task Force, the food serves as a wholesome and sustainable option to commercial products. Ingredients for the food are grown locally using heirloom seeds and are individually canned into jars. The first batch of indigenous Indigenous baby food was made in collaboration with the North American Traditional Indigenous Food Systems and the famous Oglala Lakota chef, Sean Sherman. The South Dakota legislative session will end on March 25th. ICT senior producer Shirley Snavy has this conversation with State Senator Sean Bordeaux to talk about the session highlights so far. Sean Bordeaux served in the House of Representatives for eight years. He's now in his first term on the Senate side. His district covers eight counties, including the Rosebud Sioux Indian Reservation. He's a Democrat in a Republican state. Its governor, Kristi Noem, is on the short list to be Donald Trump's VP candidate. It's been an interesting session. It, it always is, but this year has been a little bit more interesting than, uh, than what it has in the past. And it might be that there's a presidential election and our governor is vying for vice presidency. We're now uh, putting a bunch of money. We just put uh, several million dollars, I think four and a half million dollars plus to uh, put in a, a, a fund that she can use to send the National Guard down and build some more wall for uh, the good cause of keeping, uh, you know, these indigenous people who are coming up from uh, Mexico and what not. Uh, for some reason, South Dakota needs to be there in Texas to do the job of, of Texas. I don't understand it, but uh, it's costing us money out of our budgets. A tribal ID can be used to vote, but not to register to vote. Bordeaux's bill to change that was denied. It had all the support it needed. Uh, I guess some folks don't want, you know, maybe the folks over there in uh, Chamberlain or Crow Creek or wherever it is that's affecting their part of the district, they may not want them voting. And uh, that's what we see throughout South Dakota. That's what we see. Uh, I have eight counties and it's really a, a difficult thing trying to get the tribes to vote in tribal elections, let alone state elections. Another bill would have created a commission on Indian affairs. Well, I brought that a number of years and uh, they basically say that I'm trying to replace the state tribal relations committee, which I'm a member of that committee. But many of the members of the committee are non-Native Americans who live near a reservation and they don't really understand the complexity of our problems, whether it has to do with jurisdiction or sovereign immunity or the winner's doctrine. These are pretty heavy things for most of these guys to get. And a lot of them are only here for a couple of years. So by creating this Indian commission, which I'm not really creating it, it was around in the 80s and 90s. And uh, uh, Art Zimaga and folks like that were part of it back then. He's one of the people telling me that, you know, they did good work back then. They don't uh, know why it was uh, uh, terminated. But nonetheless, I think we should bring it back. There are many other states who have this type of commission. And what it would be is the tribes would fund one individual from their tribe to come quarterly to the state to talk about the issues in the state. The You know, whether it be that we need more of these uh, cross jurisdictions jurisdictional things like in Millette County or Tripp County or Gregory County where the tribes have hundreds of thousands of acres and on one side of the street is tribal land on the other side of the street is state land and it really puts the tribes and the state in a bad way when you know we can't even have uh, good policing in our neighborhoods because of the lack of these uh, uh, you know these uh, compacts or uh, you know basic uh, agreements that need to happen between, you know, not just Rosewood Reservation. I mentioned we have five counties and uh, there's a good 30 counties out of the 66 that have tribal lands throughout the state. So this isn't a problem in just my uh, district. It's throughout the state. 20 soldiers involved in the 1890 Wounded Knee Massacre received medals of honor. Bordeaux wants that reconsidered. Uh, Senator Troy Heiner got through uh, a few years ago and uh, I wanted to bring it back and try to see if I could use it to push forward the issue. 
uh, to which I think even at this moment, there's discussions going on with some of the tribes and the Department of Justice. I was I was uh, given a, a text a little bit ago about that. So uh, I don't want to say too much about that because it's not my tribe. But nonetheless, I'm glad the tribes are talking about this. The, the resolution went through 35 to nothing when Senator Heinert had it. And I felt like it's a different group of people that are senators now. I wanted to bring it back. I wanted to see if we still had the same uh, willingness to support this. And then even uh, on the federal level, we saw where uh, Secretary Holland and others had uh, legislation when she was a congresswoman and we had the Remove the Stain Act. It's much the same as what the Senate had there and trying to have those medals of honor be reconsidered and have them return. Uh, you know, it's just a bad mark on all those people who earned a medal of honor in a brave and, and uh, a great way that this country deserved. And to have these Wounded Knee Medal of Honor uh, is just a, a bad thing for all of, uh, all of America. South Dakota has eight Native Americans in the legislature, a record number. Most are Republican. I've got 10 years now. And so uh, they know I'm not going away easy and they know that there's more natives and that somehow uh, we're able to work with each other, like uh, Tyler and I working on this bill together, uh, scared the bejesus out of them because they thought, you know, here's radical Bordeaux over here. Now he's starting to partner up with our, our, our GOP members and who knows what they're gonna do. The Indians are gonna take over again if we're not careful. Shirley Snavy, ICT News. Imagining the Indian is a documentary that explores Native American mascots and representation and media. Ben West is one of the directors, writers and producers of this project. ICT's Paris Wise has this interview with him. Your documentary Imagining the Indian is an examination of movements to remove harmful imagery towards Native Americans in media and through mascots. Tell us what inspired you to pursue this topic. You know, for, for me, it was a no brainer. Uh, you know, I grew up around folks like my father, uh, Rick West and Suzanne Harjo, uh, my Cheyenne uh, auntie, um, who is really the matriarch of the mascot movement. Um, you know, she's been working on this, uh, not only this, you know, sacred places, land and water rights. Uh, she, she's, she's one of the most uh, underknown civil rights icons of, of, of my time. Um, at least. But so, you know, I was indoctrinated at, at sort of an early age uh, when it came to kind of native representation in uh, uh, across all sorts of uh, media. But, um, you know, in, in this film, we use uh, mascotting in sports as as a window through which to examine all sorts of representation and frankly, misrepresentation of native peoples. Um, across film, television, sports, pop culture, literature, the the, the whole gamut, if you will. Well, most recently, Kansas City just won the Super Bowl, and I know there were a lot of people speaking out against what they feel are racist and harmful practices that come along with their mascot. However, even though the Super Bowl's over, these conversations are not. Do you have any insight on what happens when these instances are making headlines but then seem to disappear? The film is now out on um, uh, Apple and Amazon, so uh, available to anybody who would who would like to to see it, which we're we're really really proud of and and happy about. And and we scheduled that release uh, a, a few days before the Super Bowl, uh, very strategically. And you know, although the 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 Super Bowl hype has has waned, obviously because the season's over, um, it, there there will be uh, there will be key points uh, to to. Uh, to have this this issue reemerge um, the next time Chicago's hockey team uh, is is playing and in the Stanley Cup or in the playoffs, this issue gets brought back up. Um, you know, I I don't think uh, the the mascotting issue um, do, doesn't go away until it's gone away. Um, so that there there will there will always be uh, some context or another. Um, to to make this this issue relevant, um, and you know, in, in addition to three major franchises in in our in the country, um, there are upwards of two thousand uh, schools nationwide that still 
uh, wrestle with uh, with native mascots and imagery. I know this kind of movement is a big part of your family's life work and your life work. I also know that this topic can be very divisive as some people are fans of the teams and say it's not a big deal, but to others it really is. What are your thoughts on that? A, a rationalization of, of native mascots in sports is, is that it's an honorific. In other words, that um, you know, we're, 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 we're honoring you, um, in, in these portrayals. And, uh, you know, my response to that would be that, um, that you, you, that that's incredibly patronizing and paternalistic to have somebody, uh, tell you, oh, oh no, no, you don't understand. We're honoring you. Well, even if a segment of any population in this case, be it native people, even if a segment of that pop population does not feel honored then, then that's, that's, there's a full stop there, period, end of sentence. You, you as a fan of team X, Y, or Z, do not get to tell me that, that you are honoring me when I don't feel that way. Is there a balance between good imagery and bad imagery? I, I think at this point, given, given the history of, of, of all of this, um, we, we, we need to, to focus on wholesale change. Um, uh, because you know, I, I and 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 there, there's often that question. Well, um, well, well, how do we honor Native Americans if 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 this isn't the way? Um, you know, put put Jim Thorpe's name on every NFL football. Um, he's the first commissioner ever of the NFL. That would be a great way to to honor and and respect uh, the contributions that Native people have made. Uh, mascots when they're all when they're all planes planes war bonnets on a helmet or a jersey uh, that would be apl applicable to me as a Cheyenne person but that that is not representative of the diversity of of native people um, and, and and that's that's kind of a wrinkle that 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 your the the average person probably doesn't understand. Um, the, the way that we've been represented uh, through these mascots is incredibly reductive. Um, that's something most Native people understand, but but to your, your average Kansas City fan or Chicago hockey fan or Atlanta baseball fan, that that's that that's not something that they understand. So um, I, I think we really need to uh, to concentrate on on wholesale change. Well, Ben West, thank you so much for speaking with us about your documentary, Imagining the Indian. Thank you, Paris. We head out west now to Blackfeet country in Montana to meet a man devoted to revitalizing his native language. ICT's Renata Birkenbuehl caught up with Robert Hall to ask about his work and about getting a little tiny taste of Hollywood fame. So, hello, my name is Robert. I work at our schools where I teach the Blackfoot language and literacy as well. I'm really privileged in the job that I have. I get to work with kids from childcare all the way up to senior year, and then I get to work with adults. It is a very lovely job filled with so much joy. I get to bring puppets into a classroom of kindergartners, and then I get to talk philosophy with our top students. I really enjoy the work that I do and integrating our, you know, neat books and into our daily lives is coming more and more. One of the things that we do at my school is I'm requiring a uniform writing system within our language. And in some language revitalization 
spheres that could be seen as taboo or even sacrilege. And it's kind of like that here in Blackfeet country as well. But again, the um, written word, the written word. Yeah, and how to write it because there's been really no formal accepted orthography of the Blackfoot language. And um, we have been operating under this technique, if you will, or this this mode of spelling it the way you want. And I've heard people say, we don't need that white way. Spell it the way you want. And ironically, two things that are somewhat ironic of that statement is uh, reading and writing was developed in three different places on earth. It was developed in China, Mesoamerica, and Mesopotamia. Um, so I always want to say that reading is brown. Reading's brown. It's a brown thing. Can you just talk a little bit about, were you a little bit stunned when Lily Gladstone spoke about you at, at during her acceptance speech at the Golden Globes? Um, or what, you, what oh, were yeah. you into her speaking? Oh, definitely. In her speech, she thanked the late Edward North Pagan. Edward North Pagan was an elder who lived in the community that Lily did while she was living on the reservation. And he is the one that was her main teacher. And I think that's really critical to, to share and to, to promote because we always got to honor our people. Yes. She uh, mentioned my name in her AP press interview. I was shocked and, and, well, well, I mean, I just want to say, if anything, the fact that I have become somewhat of a, uh, I don't know, a D celebrity within Indian country uh, um, and Montana, it really speaks to the gravity of Lily's performance within that film. Just the fact that she can utter somebody's name and that person eventually making it on the news being interviewed by Washington Post, even. Um, it really just speaks to how important her performance art has been to Indian country. Well, I mean, like, we're all united in supporting her and uh -huh. celebrating her, loving and her. And the young kids know and who she is. The young, young kids know who she is. The elders know who she is. Um, she's the most famous indigenous american right now uh-huh and it's That's pretty cool. lovely to somebody that you know make it to that sphere but mm -hmm. remain who they are um it's and you're like of course she's she's yeah. being funny of course you know she's gonna be that way <laughs> She's Ute for I like to speak Ute. Nu is an I. No Apagavach is to speak Ute and Astai is in to like or to love. Nu no Apagavach Astai. I like to speak Ute. Visiting with family and relatives will help us from feeling lonely or socially isolated. COVID-19 changed everything, like our ancestors who survived war, famine, and epidemics. Our elders had to make sacrifices too. The more we are socially connected with our family and community, the less health problems we will have and the longer we will live. We need to stay active to keep our spirits alive. Remember, you are not alone. Connected together, we will stand strong. For more information on elder, isolation, or caregiver resources, go to connectedindigenouselders.org. Over the weekend, Phoenix, Arizona's Herd Museum hosted its annual Native Art Market and Fair. ICT's Daniel Herrera has the reaction from attendees. Good vibes filled the air this weekend at the 66th annual Herd Indian and Fair Market in Phoenix, Arizona. And for the vendors here, it's like a big family reunion. It is like a family, you know, we see each other that we haven't seen almost like every, how many months, every year. 
Pudi Coria, an Acoma clay artist, says her favorite part of the herd market is connecting with people. Just meeting new people and talking to other artists, which are like family. So we all meet each other, see each other, and then talking to people from all over the world. That's Here at the Herd Indian Fair and Market, there are more than 400 vendors to choose from. So uh, it's, it's pretty dense with art, uh, new innovative art, uh, traditional art, something for everyone really, native art. Artisha Begay, an attendee of the herd market, said her favorite part of the event was the vast amount of indigenous cultures. I really like it here, you know, there's a bunch of, you know, different cultures here. To see a bunch of, you know, indigenous people here all in one area having a great time. As people walked through the museum grounds, there was more than enough to look through from jewelry makers to painters and sculptors. Attendees can also take a break from shopping to enjoy the various performances from singers to traditional dances. And of course, it wouldn't be the herd market without fry bread. If you missed the market this year, don't worry. You can always attend the 67th annual herd market next year in March. At the Herd Museum in Phoenix, Arizona, Daniel Herrera, ICT News. That is a slice of our indigenous world. For all the latest, visit ictnews.org. From all of us in the newsroom, stay safe, my relatives. This program is made possible by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, a private corporation funded by the American people.